Within to call my own, for I am frail of heart, my strength is gone, but deep within my soul is rising up a song here in the comfort of the faithful one. I want a narrow road through valleys deep in search of higher ground on mountains steep and though with feet on shore I still keep pressing on for I am guided by the faithful your side with thorns upon your brow you bled and died but there's an empty tomb a lawful all who come and give their hearts to you the faithful Nothing like lifting up the attributes of our God. Amen. So welcome. It's wonderful to have you here. I know we have those in the overflow section in the back. Thank you for being here and um, a group watching online. And we're so, we, we appreciate it so much. We don't take it for granted. Um, some years ago, I got to meet um, Brother Matt Perrine, him and his family, uh, have went to Petersburg, West Virginia and started a church. Uh, many of you remember Brother Daniels that used to be here. Brother Daniels um, ended up attending there and, and helping. And uh, their church has grown. The Lord is blessed. And uh, now they're in the process of purchasing land. They want to build a building. 
And so I've asked him to come. I've announced this to you. He's going to be here. And what we're going to start off with, I'm going to ask him to come and introduce a six-minute video that you can see what's happening. So good to have you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it certainly is wonderful to be here, and I appreciate the invitation to come, and uh, it's good to have my wife, Amy, and our four kids. Annie is 16, Lily is 15, Cole is 12, and Trent is 9, and, uh, and I appreciate them traveling. We are from uh, Petersburg, West Virginia. Any West Virginia, anybody from West Virginia here? Amen. A lot of you. How many of you are not from West Virginia? Would you raise your hand? But you wish you were. I thought so. And uh, everybody wants to be from uh, West Virginia. And, uh, but it is wonderful to be here, and I'm thankful uh, again for Pastor Robert. Uh, we've been over a couple times the last few years for revival meetings and different things. And then uh, he came over and preached at our church a couple of years ago for one of our missions conferences in an evening service. And I'm thankful for this church and the lighthouse that it is to this area and uh, the encouragement you all have been to us. And um, in May of 2016, our family moved to Petersburg from the other side of West Virginia. And uh, God allowed us to start the South Branch Baptist Church. We didn't do it by ourselves. And uh, you'll see here in just a minute in the video, we had a lot of help. And I believe the biblical pattern of churches reproducing churches, start churches starting other churches is so evident uh, in our lives. And so uh, this video kind of gives an update of where we are now, but gives a little bit of a history about uh, what God has done. And he has done it over the last seven years. And so uh, if you'll take a, a watch and a look here, and, uh, and again, we're thankful that God's allowed us to be here today. I've heard it said many times that God's will will not take us where God's grace will not sustain us. What Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I'm thankful that God's word is true. Uh, my name is Matt Perrine and I pastor the South Branch Baptist Church. In 2016, God led my family and me uh, to plant this church in beautiful Petersburg, West Virginia. Thankfully, we didn't have to do it alone. We had so much help and we learned uh, very quickly that churches start other churches. Uh, in those early days, we didn't know what we were doing, but we knew that God wanted to do something special in this place, and God certainly has done that. We learned that God always provides what we need and who we need in His perfect timing. We began the church in an old bank building, and God used many people to pray for us, to help remodel that building, uh, to give financially to support us, and then to provide boots on the ground to help uh, get the word out, to pass gospel literature out. And I'm thankful for all the help that we had. We made a lot of mistakes. We learned what to do and a lot of what not to do. But God remained faithful through it all. And by God's grace, we began to grow and began to see people saved. And the building started to fill. And so we did the only thing that we knew to do. We began to pray and to trust God. And through all that early day process, we learned that God always does provide what we need and who we need in His perfect timing. Our children have definitely grown up over the last few years, and I don't think we were quite anticipating how God was going to use them to help us in the ministry, from helping clean the church building to working in the nurseries and the children's classes and special music and door knocking. From the very beginning, one of our greatest prayer requests was that God would provide them with friends and our family with friends. And God has done just that from the very beginning. He has surrounded us with a wonderful church family. And I was looking at my prayer journal this week, and I looked at the prayer list that we had before the church even started. And I was quickly reminded how God used Christ-centered churches and individuals to answer every prayer request that we had from our kids' personal prayer request for our chocolate lab to this stone church sign, which is our Ebenezer. It reminds us constantly that God is our help. He is our provider and he's a sovereign sustainer of all things. God, once again, by His grace, began to answer prayer. 
And on our second anniversary, God allowed us to move into the building we are currently in today. And that was a miraculous story of how God provided all of that. God gave us favor, certainly with Him, thankfully, uh, but also with other people. And God uh, opened up this door that we could double our space into this auditorium. And once again, by God's grace, we begin to see people saved. We begin to see people really grow in their faith. We saw families come and families grow together. And we saw people baptized and, and added to the church. And we're so thankful for God's blessing and all of that. But once again, it was very evident that we were going to need some more space to grow. So again, we began to pray and to trust God. And we began to ask God that he would uh, provide something for us to have a permanent location. We currently uh, lease the space we're in now. But we prayed that God would uh, give us more space to grow and to expand, but also that we would have greater opportunity to advance the Word of God, to advance the Gospel only for His glory. God has once again answered our prayer, and we are standing on seven acres of property that uh, was purchased and donated to our church. We shouldn't be surprised when God answers prayer, but we were blown away. And our church is so excited, and this, God willing, will provide us more space to reach more people, uh, to extend the gospel to more people, uh, to serve our community in a greater way, and just to provide a space where others can grow in God's grace. And uh, we're very excited, but it's also a very expensive project. Uh, to put it bluntly, we're a very young church that needs to raise a very significant amount of money. And we know that God is in control and we know that God has led us here perfectly in His timing. Construction costs are high, material costs are high, and our church has already been saving for the last several years for this moment. Our church is already giving generously, but we know that we can't do this alone. And we are launching a Magnify the Lord giving campaign. And would you pray about how God would allow you to be involved? We certainly need prayer. Uh, we need God's direction and God's favor and God's joy through this whole process. Uh, but we also need provision. There's a lot of ways you can be involved, whether it's a one-time gift, whether it's an offering, or even uh, spread out over the next couple of years. Uh, we believe that God has all the resources already that we need uh, to finish this campaign. We're trusting the Lord once again to provide what we need and who we need in His perfect timing. We have been given a great opportunity, and with a great opportunity comes a great responsibility. We want to be sensitive to the Lord's leading, and we want to follow Him perfectly in all that He has for us to do. We have a big job ahead of us. This is a big task. We serve a big God. We're trusting the Lord uh, that He will once again provide in His perfect time. Thank you so much for praying for us. We definitely need it. Thank you for giving. Thank you for your generosity and supporting us. Psalm 34 3 says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. God bless you. I'm so excited about that and uh, see what the Lord just will do there. Um, every Thanksgiving, brother, we take up foodstuffs and we give it away, but we also take up an offering. And this offering is for you and your church. It's $15,000. Oh, my goodness. All right. Wow. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Um, well, th thank you. Um, praise the Lord. I uh, was certainly not expecting that. And um, again, as I said in the video, we shouldn't be surprised when God answers prayer. But once again, I'm just blown away. Um, I, I don't even know you all. <laughs> um, but thank you. Thank you from the bottom of our heart. Um, what a blessing that is. And um, what an encouragement that is. Uh, I, again, I, I, I don't know what to say other than Praise the Lord, and thank you for your generosity. What a, what a great blessing. And uh, Pastor, thank you th so much, and uh, thank you for allowing us to be here today. Uh, God's so good, isn't He? And um, I've been trying personally in my own heart uh, just to be a more thankful and grateful person. And, um, and this week of Thanksgiving, certainly that is a, an emphasis that we all try to make, but uh, I certainly want to, uh, to exemplify that. Thank you so very much, and uh, what a blessing. Uh, we do ask that you pray. Uh, our property, again, was donated to us, and we're thankful 
Uh, we have um, con we've been with an architect, and he's drawn up some plans. We don't have blueprints yet. That'll be the next step. Uh, the site work has begun on the property, started about three or four weeks ago, and uh, will be finished. It's taken a break through the winter, should be finished in the spring. And so um, God's guiding us, and uh, we're just trying to follow him. And, um, and you pray with us. Thank you so much. God bless you. Wow, what a blessing. If you have your Bible this morning, would you take it with me, please, to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter number 14. Exodus chapter number 14. Let's pray together, all right? Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your goodness to us. And um, Lord, you're a wonderful God. As we just heard saying a moment ago, you're so faithful to us. And uh, Lord, because you're faithful, we're here today. Lord, we don't deserve anything. We don't deserve to be here today. Lord, I don't deserve to be up here speaking today. Lord, we can look back at our lives and, and Lord, think about how we've been less than faithful to you. But Lord, you've always been there for us. And I'm thankful for that. Lord, I thank you for churches and, and folks that uh, love you and are faithful to you. And Lord, that desire to be an encouragement to others. And uh, Lord, this church and this pastor has certainly done that for me and for my family. And uh, Lord, I'm so excited to go back tonight and share that with our church. Lord, I pray that you would bless them for their generosity. Help them to know, truly know, what a blessing they are. And now, Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you that we can study your word. And Lord, that we can draw truth from your word and apply to our lives. Lord, I thank you for your Holy Spirit. And so uh, today, that's who we turn to, to illuminate your scripture and your word to us. Uh, Lord, as we study this familiar passage, I pray that it would not just be words on a page, uh, but God, that you would, um, you would help it to come to life to us, that it would be real to us, and that your Holy Spirit would make application. Help me as I speak and as I preach today. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would help me to be faithful to your word, and uh, God, that you do the work that I cannot do, and that is speak to hearts today. And uh, Lord, I pray that, uh, again, you would just bless your word. Bless this time we have together. In Jesus' name that I pray, amen. amen. As we come to the book of Exodus, I, uh, in our church over the last year and a half, we have studied through the book of Exodus. And uh, actually just last Sunday, I finished the last chapter of the book of Exodus in our study on Sunday mornings. And it's been a help to me. It's been an encouragement to me. And uh, I've learned a lot and, and come to a lot of new passages, but really, as we come to Exodus 14, this is not a, an unfamiliar passage if we have been in church or if we've studied the Bible. Uh, to some of us, it may be new. To some of us, this may all be new. And if it is, then uh, thank the Lord for it, and I'll try to explain a little bit what's going on in the book of Exodus. Uh, but the children of Israel, God's chosen people, have been in bondage in Egypt for over 400 years. And they have, God has heard their cry, and He has uh, sent Moses, the deliverer, to Pharaoh, uh, the king of Egypt, to, to deliver the message that God wants His people to go free. And of course, Pharaoh did not want that to happen. They had uh, been in hard labor and he had been uh, using them as slaves for all those years. And God sends the plagues upon the Egyptians. Uh, the plagues of the flies and the plagues of the locust and the plagues of the uh, death on the cattle and the darkness and the hail. And finally, in that last plague, the angel passed over and the firstborn of every household that did not have the blood applied to the door uh, was taken away that night. So Pharaoh says, get them out of here. In Exodus chapter 13, the children of Israel pack up and they leave Egypt to go into what we know as the promised land. But it's going to take them a while to get there. And as they're leaving, we come to Exodus chapter number 14. 
And uh, the Bible says that Pharaoh kind of comes to himself, I guess you could say. His heart was hardened once again, and he realizes that all of the labor and all of the slaves have left, and now he wants them back. And so he decides to pursue them, and he gets the army, and he gets the chariots together, and he begins to pursue two million Jewish people that are, have made their way across out of Egypt into the wilderness to go into Canaan's land. And we pick that up reading, if you'll look, in, ver in uh, Exodus chapter number 14 and verse number 19. We're going to read down to the end of the chapter if you'll follow along. Exodus chapter 14 and verse 19. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels and that they drave them heavily. So that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, and the that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, and upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the hosts of Pharaoh and came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians de dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and His servant Moses. And if you'll notice a phrase found in verse number 31, we just read it, where the Bible says, And Israel saw that great work. The Egyptians, as, as we come to this passage, as we know the children of Israel have gone out of Egypt, and as we come to this setting on the Red Sea, the Egyptians are behind the Israelites. Now kind of put yourself uh, and let your mind wander, not, not to lunch, but let your mind wander back to uh, Israel and where the Red Sea is for just a moment tonight or this morning. And we understand that the, the children of Israel are there at a stopping point. And they're looking around. Behind them they see Pharaoh and the chariots of Egypt bearing down on them, coming after them to take them back to Egypt. They're looking around to their left and to their right, and they see a desolate wilderness, a place that they had never been, a place that was unfamiliar. And right in front of them is the mighty Red Sea. In front of them is an obstacle that they cannot cross on their own. And they come to Moses and say, Moses, what are we going to do at the, uh, at the beginning of Exodus chapter 14? And, and they said, Moses, we, we look behind and there's Pharaoh. We look around and there's the wilderness. We look in front of us and there is the Red Sea. Moses, you're our leader. You brought us out of here. Moses, what are we going to do? And they're hanging on every word. And here's what Moses says. All right. Moses comes and says, all right, I've got a word from the Lord. I know what we're supposed to do. Uh, the, uh, Egypt is behind us. The wilderness is around us. The Red Sea is in front of us. I know what God wants us to do. Here it is. Are you ready? And the children of Israel are like, yes, absolutely. We are ready. Tell us what we're supposed to do. And Moses says, nothing. You're supposed to stand still. Now, wait a minute, uh, Moses, I, I, I thought you had a word from the Lord. And, and Moses says, I did in, in, in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. 
So they say, all right, Moses, you want us to do nothing. You want us to stand still. He says, that's right. In verse number 14, he says, don't worry about it. The Lord is fighting for us. The Lord is on our side. Uh, hold your peace. Make sure that you're okay. And they say, all right, Moses, we'll stand here. We'll do nothing. We'll wait. We'll trust the Lord. And then he comes back in verse 15. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. So Moses comes back to the children of Israel, and, and he says, All right, I've got another instruction. We've done what God wants. Now here's what God wants us to do. They say, All right, Moses, tell us. God says, We need to go forward. Go forward. Go forward into the sea. Go forward in, in, into the, the place where we could drown. And Moses says, that's exa exactly right. We need to go forward. You know, what seems, like, what seems like an aimless direction to others is a purposeful direction to those who are following the Lord. You know, there's, there are times and there are things that we do as believers. There are things that we do as the church as we go forward and as we're trying to follow God. Uh, that when others look at our direction, they think that it may just be an aimless direction. They think that it may just be a purposeless direction. But when we are following the Lord, when we are trusting God, and when we are asking the Lord to guide us, we understand that when God leads us, it's not by accident and it's not by coincidence, but God is leading us in His direction. And that's exactly what God is doing to the children of Israel. And they witness God miraculously part the Red Sea. Uh, they go across in safe passage. They go across on dry land. Uh, they watch behind as the enemy, as Pharaoh and his chariots are defeated and as are drowned in the sea. And after all of that, after they see that, after they experience that, as Moses himself, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, is pinning these words in Exodus, he describes all of those things that he had just seen. He describes the parting. He describes the dry land. He describes the defeat of the enemy with these words in verse number 31, and Israel saw that great work. Here's the words that Moses uses to describe. This is a great work of God. That word saw in verse number 31, Israel saw, that word saw means to perceive or to consider. They considered what God had done. The word work there in verse number 31, it has the idea of God's open hand in their lives. It indicates that God was moving with power, that God was moving with provision, and that God was directing them. In other words, when Israel saw what God had done, they saw God's open and active hand at work in their lives. You know, God's, God is at work in all of our lives, is He not? Now, I don't believe this. I don't believe that God is literally parting a red sea for us this morning. N none of us are looking at a literal sea or an ocean that we need to be parted and we need to go across on dry land. We're not doing that. But some of us are facing some obstacles. And even if we are not, even if we are just experiencing victory after victory, we know that God is active and God is at work and God is powerful and God is providing and God is directing and God's active hand in our life is not just for our recognition, but what God does in our life is there for our response. Amen. And there is a difference, isn't, isn't there? When the Bible says that Israel saw that great work, they recognized the great work of God. They saw what God had done. But God did not part the Red Sea, and God did not bring them out of Egypt, and God did not defeat the enemy just for them to recognize it. He did that so that they would respond to Him and draw closer to Him, and so that they would grow in their faith. You see, our belief affects our behavior. And what we believe to be true about God is not just for our head knowledge, but it is for our actions and it is for our behavior. And I think all of us can acknowledge the generalities of God's work, can't we? We can all, I mean, I mean, let's just be honest, it's Thanksgiving week or we've just come out of Thanksgiving. I would imagine that most of us have said, God, thank you for your many blessings, right, this week. I would imagine that. And phrases like that, phrases like God is good all the time and, and God is blessing are indicators that we acknowledge or that we consider the generalities of God's work. You see, the specifics of God's work demand an effect 
on our thinking and on our conduct. God is good to all of us, but God is doing a specific work in each and every one of our lives. And God is good and God is faithful. And man, that, that song a moment ago was wonderful. He is a wonderful, merciful Savior. And God is faithful and we ought to worship Him because of that. And, and we know that to be true in general. But God is doing an active and a specific work in your life and in your heart and in your family and in your church. And in that specifics, those specific, that specific work demands that our thinking and our conduct is affected by what God is doing in our life. In other words, we cannot recognize what God is doing and go about our daily business like nothing is going on. When we see what God is doing in our life, it affects how we think and it affects how we act. So let's consider that this morning. Let's, let's understand God's great work. First of all, Israel saw that great work through the night. Through the night. Look in verse number 21, if you would. It says, As Mo Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind, notice this phrase, all that night. And so in the middle of the night, when you can't see anything, Moses is there stretching his hand, stretching his rod out over the Red Sea. Moses keeps his head about him. He doesn't panic. But also Moses keeps his faith where it belongs. His faith is in Almighty God. You know, when we are going through nighttime seasons of life, when we are uh, in those times of life where we can't see, where it's unknown, where we don't recognize what's going on, it is our faith in an almighty, faithful, all-knowing, all-powerful God that keeps us grounded during those uncertain times in life, that keeps us grounded during those demanding moments, that keeps us grounded during those times where we feel pressured from all kinds of different avenues. And our faith keeps us grounded. Somebody said this, when the hand of God cannot be traced, God's heart can be trusted. And that's very evident in this passage. Look, when the hand of God cannot be traced in the night, they couldn't actually see physically what God was doing, but his heart could be trusted. In verse number 20 it says that the presence of God, that pillar of fire and pillar of cloud, came in between the uh, camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud of darkness to them. But notice what it says, but it gave light to these. So when God's hand can't be traced, His heart can be trusted. Even in the middle of the night, God's heart and God's, our faith in who God is can give us light to maneuver during these situations. That pillar of fire by night, that pillar of cloud by day had guided them. And their path was obvious. And their only forward path was right through the middle of this Red Sea. In verse number 19 and verse number 20, it says, The angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. That pillar of cloud was a symbol of God's presence. It was what they knew was there. And that symbol of His presence moved from being an advanced guide to now it moved to the back to being a rear guard. It says it removed and went behind them. It was no longer the, uh, leading them, but now it was protecting them. And I'm thankful that God does that for us, that He leads us into places and, and God takes us where He wants us to go, but He does not leave us hanging. He will protect us. And God's protection was needed for the children of Israel as the enemy was pressing on their heels. You know, you and I face a different enemy. We don't face Egypt and we don't face Pharaoh and we don't face chariots, but we face every single day the world and the flesh and the devil. And our enemy, the enemies that we face every day is pressing on our heels and God knows what He needs to do and God will guide us and, and we don't have the visible presence of a pillar of cloud uh, directing us, but we have the indwelling presence of the Spirit of God in our life and that Spirit of God guides us when we need to go forward, but then it goes behind us when we need protect. Aren't you glad about that? Notice what it says in verse number 20. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. That in between work is an unseen work. What God is doing in between us and the enemy, it can't always be seen by us. But I'm thankful that we know that God is protecting us from the enemy. Aren't you? 
And I can't imagine how many times in my life as I'm going forward, how many times in your life as we're trying to follow God, that God's Holy Spirit is there in between us and in between the enemy and in between that attack. And He is there protecting us and we can't see it and we don't know it's there. But through the night we can see the great work of God in our life. It's in the place where we need, the need is most felt and in the form that is most required God will be to those who trust Him. In the middle of the night, God's presence was there protecting them. In the middle of the night, God's presence was there as a light guiding them. And in in the night, in the place where they did not know what was going to happen, they saw God's great work. Are you in that kind of place today? I know it's not nighttime, but maybe you're in a season of life where it's a little bit unknown, uncertain. Maybe it's a season of life where you're struggling and you don't know exactly what to do next. God is at work in your life and He he has not disappeared and He has not gone away from you. He is there in between working on your behalf. Notice what the Bible says in verse 24. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, guess what happened? Eventually the night came to to an end. And the morning came, and and what they could see in the morning was different than what they could see at night. And many times that morning watch seems like it is never coming. You ever had a restless night of sleep? And you just toss and turn all night, and you just wish that it would be daylight, and you just wish that it could be morning so you could get out of bed and, and end the misery of a sleepless night? Sometimes we have long nights, and in those long nights... It may seem like morning is never coming, but when it does, when the morning comes, we can see what God has brought us through. I want you to hold your place in the book of Exodus and go over to Psalm 77 for just a moment. Let me show you just a passage of Scripture quickly. Psalm 77. As God was leading them in His path and in His way, Even in the middle of the night, Israel saw the great work that God was doing. Psalm 77, Israel's hymn book. The psalmist talks about God's way and God's direction. I like in verse 1, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and He gave ear unto me. Aren't you glad that God always hears us? In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My sore ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. The psalmist here, Asaph, is saying, even in the middle of the night, I was having trouble. And he turns to the Lord and he he says in verse number, uh, at the end of verse number four, I am so troubled that I cannot speak. He's there in one of these night seasons. And then he, verse 11, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember the wonders of old. I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of thy doings. He says in verse 13, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. I like those sanctuary times. I like those times where there is a peace and there is a calm. And I I love those moments where God's way leads us through the sanctuary, a place of protection, a place where we can get alone, and a place where we can just kind of let our, let our, ah, okay, this is wonderful. But then he goes on to say in verse number 19, thy way is in the sea. Now, wait a minute. Well, you mean God brings us through moments of peace and moments of quietness and moments of victory and moments of sanctuary and moments of calm. God leads us through there. Absolutely, He does. But then Asaph says in verse 19, Thy way is in the sea and thy path in the great waters and thy footsteps are not known. Yes, God leads us through those times of sanctuary. I'm thankful. But God also leads us through times of the sea in the middle of the night when we can't see when his steps are unknown and look at what the Bible says in verse 20 thou lettest thy people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron what's Asaph talking about he's talking about the story that we just read in Exodus chapter 14 where God led the children Israel by the hand of Moses and Aaron through the midst of the sea and his steps were unknown but they followed him in the darkness and they realized that God was doing a great work in their life sometimes it's a long wait between night and morning but finally when the morning light appears we can see look back what God has brought us through 
There's probably times in your life where it was an unknown darkness and you get to the other side and God brought you through and right now where you're sitting, you can look back and you can think, wow, that was a, that was a crazy time. <laughs> but God sure did bring me through and God sure was faithful. You know what we ought to do? Recognize that great work that God did in our lives in the night. Israel saw that great work in the night, through the night. Number two, if you'll go back to Exodus chapter 14, Israel saw that great work in the midst. In the midst. Look in verse 22. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground. So there they are looking across the Red Sea. And God says, go right through the middle of it. Now, could God have literally picked up the Red Sea and moved it out of the way and for them to go across? Could He have absolutely removed that obstacle? Yes. But He led them through the middle of it, into the midst of it. You know, there, I think this, that we got to be careful when we ask God. Many times we ask God to remove the very thing that He is using to advance His work in us and advance His work in others. Now, could God have, re have removed the sea? Yes. But God was using that Red Sea to advance His work in the children of Israel. And we may be looking at an obstacle, and we're asking God, God, remove this obstacle, remove this obstacle. And God may do that, and He can do that. But sometimes God leads us right through the middle of that obstacle. And what that does, it shows us and advances our faith and our trust in Him. And so God parts the Red Sea. He literally part of the Red Sea. And they didn't walk across on muddy ground. It was dry ground. You say, well, how do you explain that? I, I don't have to explain it. God explains it. He did it. The miraculous does not require a natural explanation. The miraculous requires a supernatural amazement. And you say, well, it was just a shallow place. No, it wasn't. It was a sea where God parted and there was a wall of water on that side and a wall of water on that side. And as a kid and now as a 40-year-old man, my first thought is this. Could they see fish swimming through that Red Sea with a wall? I mean, was it like walking through an aquarium? I kind of think it was. I really do. I think it was. And if I was a kid and even an adult, I would be a mate. Wow, look at that. That's, that's incredible. It was a supernatural amazement. The effect produced by ordinary means was extraordinary. What happened? There was a wind that blew the water in opposite directions. Who sent that wind? God sent that wind. Was it a natural wind? No, it was a supernatural wind. They trusted, the children of Israel trusted God's open hand to venture on a road where those walls could collapse at any moment, drowning them all. You know what? Even as they were walking in amazement, they still had to trust God because at any moment those walls could collapse, couldn't they? But they waded out, not into wet gra uh, ground, but they waded out into the midst of the sea on dry land, trusting God's hand at work. You know, God often calls us into perilous paths to follow Him even in the midst of obstacles. To follow Him even in the midst of darkness. To follow Him even when the wind is at our face. The children of Israel in the middle of that night, they walked across on dry land. It took them all night, took them into the morning where they could see. They had to trust God that He wasn't going to collapse it. They had to trust God that He was going to lead them through that darkness. That presence was a guiding light to them. They had to trust God even when the wind was at their face blowing against them. They had to trust God that He was at work even in the midst of their obstacle. They were driven into that sea by the fear of Pharaoh. But it was really the faith in God's hand that was their ultimate motivator. You know, it's easy for us to advance forward when there is mo momentum. But it takes faith to advance in the unknown situations. You know, when everything is going good, it's easy to go forward for God, isn't it? When everybody's rah, rah, and every good thing is happening, and we're praising God for this and praising God for that. And, and when there's momentum, momentum, and when everybody's going forward, and when we can see the path, and when we know what's going on, it's easy for us to advance. But it takes faith and it takes trust to advance in the midst of the unknown situations. 
God doesn't always remove our obstacles from us, but sometimes He simply makes a way through them. Amen. And that's exactly what God did for the children of Israel. He didn't take the Red Sea away. He just made a way that they could go straight through it. And in the midst of that obstacle, they saw God's great work. You may be facing an obstacle. You may be praying about it. Keep praying. Keep trusting. But when God reveals His path, even when it's perilous, even when it looks a little bit sketchy, when it's a little bit unknown, you can still step forward in the faith that God is at work in your life. Israel saw that great work through the night. Israel saw that great work in the midst. Then thirdly, it will be finished. Israel saw that great work in the people. In the people. Notice what the Bible says in verse 31. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and His servant Moses. If you don't get anything else, please understand this. The greatest work that God did that day was not in the sea or in the Egyptians. The greatest work that God did that day was in the heart of His people. The Bible says in verse 31, the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord. Two very important things. Two very major things. And that's what God's great work, when we recognize God's work, that's what it causes us to do. It causes us to fear the Lord or to reverence Him, to put Him in His proper place. And our reverence to God leads us to repentance and it leads to worship. And then the Bible says they believe the Lord. Our belief leads to surrender and it leads to service. Remember what I said in the very beginning? That God's great work was not just for their recognition, it was for their response. That their belief affected their behavior. And when the Bible says they reverenced God and they believed the Lord, it didn't just set them back talking about and, and pondering, it caused them to make a change in their behavior. Now they're there, and now they were ashamed of their distrust. You know what they were saying back in the previous chapter? Lord, we, Moses, we should have just stayed in Egypt. If they're going to come, we should have just stayed. You brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness. It would have been better for us just to die in Egypt. We might as well go back to Egypt. That's always a mistake. <laughs> for, us to all, for us to go back, it's always a mistake. But now they're ashamed of their distrust. Now they're ashamed of their complaints against Moses. Now they were ashamed of their desire to go back to Egypt. The fact of the matter is, they had seen God's work even before Exodus 14, had they not? Had they seen God's power displayed before He parted the Red Sea? Yeah. How did they see that? They saw the plagues that they brought on the Egyptians. They recognized what God did to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians. They realized that God had revealed Himself to them as Jehovah God, as Yahweh, as the self-existent covenant God of Israel. But how soon they forgot when troubled times come. You know, you and I can look back and we can see and we can recognize the work of God in our life and we can be thankful for it, but we've got to guard against being uh, uh, compl uh, complacent. We've got to guard against being discontented. We've got to guard against be becoming entitled because it is very apt for us to forget the goodness of God when we're going through troubled times in our life. We see God's works, but how soon we can forget them as you and I witness God's work in the night, as you and I in the night seasons of life, as you and I witness God's work in the midst of our obstacles, we must not, we cannot disregard what God is doing in us. And again, the greatest work that God did on the banks of the Red Sea that day is not parting the Red Sea. The greatest work that God did that day was not bringing the Red Sea back down on Pharaoh. The greatest work that God did in that day was changing the hearts of His own people. And you and I cannot focus on the darkness. You and I cannot focus on the waters around us. But we've got to focus on what God is doing in the midst of the darkness and in the midst of the waters all around us. It's very easy for us when we're going through a time to only look at the obstacle. 
It's easy for us when we're going through something to only look at the darkness, the unknown. But the greatest work that God is doing in those situations is in what He's doing in your own heart. And the most supernatural thing that God did on that day was not the parting of the Red Sea. It was the changing of the heart of His people. You see, everything external is done for the internal. And everything that we see God do on the outside is done so that He can change us and mold us into what He wants us to be on the inside of our lives. And the most important place of recognition is our own personal life. God's work in salvation, God's work in redeeming His people, the children of Israel, is no less supernatural than the work of salvation that He does in every one of our hearts. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, He has redeemed you. He has brought you out of the slavery of sin. And that work is not an earthly work. That work is a divine work. And God delivers us by His mercy and by His power and gives us the freedom to go forward for Him. If you're here this morning, you're listening this morning, and you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you're listening this morning and you're, you know if you were to die right now, you're not 100% sure you'd go to heaven, then the greatest work that God wants to do right now is to forgive you of your sin and to change your life and to change your heart and to make you a new creation and to deliver you out of that bondage of sin and set your feet upon a rock and establish your going so that you can go forward in following and recognizing God's great work in your own life. God's work is all on God. And I'm thankful for that, aren't you? Because if, if God's work depended on me, there would be nothing that got done. God's work is all on God. But watch this, please. Our response is all on us. God's not a bully and God doesn't force Himself on any of us. But when we see God's work, what does it do? It demands a response from His children to draw closer to Him, to search our heart, to see if there's something there that should not be there, to reverence Him, to repent, to trust, and to sacrifice and to give of our lives in our service to Him. And if God's work doesn't cause us to respond, then I don't believe we are truly seeing or recognizing what God is doing in our life. Israel saw that great work, and what a great work it was, was it not? And I'm sure as Moses, under the inspiration of the Spirit, it starts to pen these words. How can I explain this? Israel saw that. What did they see? What did they recognize? They saw God's active, mighty, powerful hand at work on their behalf. And that work demanded that they would respond, Lord, I'm yours. Lord, I'm following you. Lord, I'm surrendering to you. Lord, Show me what you want me to do next. Church, God has done a great work in our lives. I'm thankful that we can recognize that. But in that recognition, let's not fail to respond according to His plan. Would you bow with me in prayer, please? You may be here this morning and you're going through one of those night seasons. It's dark, unknown. You say, preacher, what am I to do? Recognize God's great work in the night and respond to Him and following Him. You may be here looking at an obstacle in your, in your life and you think, how am I going to get through that? Preacher, what should I do? Recognize God's great work and follow God's path through that obstacle. Preacher, what is God doing in my life? I don't know what He's doing, but He's doing something. He's always at work. He's never stationary. Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China, said this, God's work was never intended to be stationary, but always advancing. God is at work. God is advancing. What's He doing in your life? I can't answer that. That's the Holy Spirit's job. But as we recognize what God's doing, let's respond Let's take a step forward in His plan for our life. Father, use, I pray, Your Word in our hearts this morning. In Christ's name that I pray, Pastor.
Great application. I wonder if there will be some believers here today, say, Preacher, I feel like I'm on the, the edge of the water and it just hasn't parted. And I know I need to trust the Lord, but I'm, I'm at a place of struggle. Uh, could I see your hands? This morning, Preacher, I'm at a place of struggle. Yes, yes. God bless you. God bless you. Would there be something today that the Lord has given you that you need to pray over? I'm going to take just a moment. As the pianist plays right where you are, I want you to bow your heads and pray over whatever God has spoken to you about. Let's just take a minute. 